Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. You guys are doing well this morning. What? Amen. Amen. Somebody back there is doing well. Praise the Lord. You know, after a, a moment like that, it's just hard to just kind of dive in when you sense the presence of the Lord the way it has been this morning. Could you just give the Lord a round of applause this morning? You know, it truly is a privilege to be able to feel God's presence the way he oftentimes allows us to do it. And so it's, as Pastor said, we should never take moments like this for granted. Amen. I can just feel the presence of God really heavy this morning. So I'm just trying to be respectful and honorable to what the Lord is doing. Could you just raise your hands just this morning for just a brief moment? Father, we just welcome you. May the power and presence of your Holy Spirit just fill this place. Father, whatever the need is, we understand you, above all things, can meet the need. And so, Father, every individual in this place this morning, we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus that you will touch their lives, Lord God, that today will be a day of transformation. As you open their hearts, renew the minds of your people, Lord God, we thank you for the transformation that shall take place. We thank you for healing. We thank you, Father God, for moving on us this morning. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And so this morning we continue the series, as Pastor said, in Romans chapter. Chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 is where we're diving into this morning. So if we want to get the timer going, we could, because otherwise I'll abuse the time, y'all. So put the pressure on me. Amen. The title that I've given this in reference to chapter 4 is The Faith of Abraham, a Model for Righteousness. The Faith of Abraham, a Model for Righteousness. And as we said earlier today, we are going to dive into the richness of this particular book and this specific chapter because the Apostle Paul touches on some important factors related to the life of Abraham. Paul presents us with a powerful, powerful, powerful example of faith through the life of Abraham. In this chapter, what we see is that it demonstrates how faith, which is pretty important based on what we see the Lord was leading Julissa and Pastor Ariel even talk about this morning. It's that this chapter demonstrates how faith rather than works is the key to righteousness before God. This is what this particular trap chapter encapsulates. My hope is to dive into the text and explore the profound lessons that you and I can learn from Abraham's faith. Now, there's this quote from this pretty intelligent guy, and this is the quote here I want to read, and it's this. I don't know if you've met this guy before, but we can put the quote up. This quote says this, show me someone's actions, and I'll tell you what they believe. <laughs> I don't know if you know that guy. I've met him once. Show me someone's actions, and I'll tell you what they believe. Guys, what we believe about anything will manifest in our behavior. Romans 4 is all about Abraham's faith being counted as righteousness. There's another quote from the same guy, and it's this. Faith is simply our response to what we put our faith in, in action. I'll say that again. Faith is simply our response to what we have put our faith in, in action action. In other words, what we're doing, we're demonstrating the very thing we've actually put our faith and hope in. When it comes to the life of Abraham, there's some things that I think is important for us to talk about in Romans chapter 4. The first thing I want to talk about, the first point is the faith of Abraham. The first few verses from verses 1 to verse 5, Paul begins to raise an important question that continues to echo even through the ages today. 
And here's what it says in Romans 4.1. What then shall we say about Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? What has he found? What did Abraham find when it comes to faith? Paul then goes on and highlights that Abraham was justified not by works, but by faith. Aren't you glad that you and I do not get justified by our works, but by our faith? Here's why, if you don't know why that's important, here's why that's important, because some of us can do a better job than others. I'm honest, some of y'all can do a far better job at some things that some of us cannot do. So if it was based on works, you have a head up on most of us. But guess what? It's not based on works. It's solely based on faith in Jesus Christ. He highlights this clearly. Abraham's righteousness that we often hear about came not from his obedience to the law, which was all about works. What can you do? Have you ever had somebody say, what can you do for me lately? Sometimes our relationships with one another and how we treat each other is solely based on what have you done for me lately. Imagine if God was to approach you and I with the attitude of what have you done for me lately? You see, some of you in this room this morning, life has been hard for you. Life has been tough on you, and you can't do nothing. Imagine if God was dependent on you having to do something to earn his love, to earn his mercy, to earn his grace. We will all fall short. This is why the Bible tells us we have fallen short. So that we don't get it confused nor twisted and think that we can do something about it. Listen, when it comes to salvation as Christians and believers putting our faith in Jesus. If we're not careful, we can begin to place markers in people's lives as though there are levels of salvation. In other words... We can act as though we are more saved than someone else. By the laughter, I think some of y'all met some of those folks. Acting as though they have a knockoff version of faith. And we have the authentic, hot hot off the press faith in Jesus. You know, I grew up in the inner city, and so in the inner city, because it's so dingy and grimy in the inner city, the only thing that you have to show that, that, that it makes you feel good is just materialism. I don't know if you've been in the inner city and that's your story, but in the inner city is why you find it'd be a bum, broken down building apartment, but, but, but they got $300 shoes on and a $1,000 jacket on because that's the only thing you can show that there's value in your life. And, and the very thing that you do is see, is that an authentic jacket, shoe, or sneaker, or is that a knockoff version? And we don't realize, because we're so used to that in the natural realm, we do that in Christianity. Is that a knockoff version of faith, or do you have the authentic faith? As if you can do anything about your faith in God. Look at somebody and say, be careful. Have you ever met somebody that gave off this holier-than-thou vibe? Like they have achieved something you could not? This is why Abraham's faith was counted as righteousness. Because he could take no credit for what the father had done in his life. In Romans 4.3 Here's what it reads. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. It didn't say Abraham was the tallest. Abraham was the fastest. Abraham was the strongest. Abraham was the most intelligent. Abraham was the most influential. It didn't say any of that as the reason. It simply says that he believed God. And because of him believing God, the Bible says it was counted to him as as righteousness. This truth reminds us that righteousness is a gift from God. 
you can't even claim your own righteousness. I can't claim my own righteousness. It's a gift from God himself. Whew. You know why I must come from him? Because it's too expensive. You couldn't afford it in the first place. Have you ever gotten a gift that's worth a lot of money? You want to let everybody know you got that. You want, I mean, it don't even make sense that you have it, but you just want to show it because it has value. That's your righteousness, church. You should let the world know that you didn't earn this righteousness. This was a gift from God. He saw you, and therefore, he placed this gift on your life. It is received through faith. Our good works, though important, we should do good. That's what the Bible tells us. Our good works, though important, do not earn us salvation at all. And some of y'all need to hear this. It is our trust in God, demonstrated by our faith in Jesus, that leads us to righteousness. Here's why some of you need to hear this this morning. Because you'll tell me, Pastor, you don't know my history. You don't know the dark things that I have done. I'm going to let that sit there for a moment. Because some of you right now, even this morning, that is still a burden you carry in your heart. All the things that you have done. And I want you to know that this is the enemy trying his very best for you to hold on to what God has already nailed to the cross. It's nailed on the cross. You want to know why it's nailed on the cross? Because it counts for nothing. It counts for nothing. You see, while some of us have done bad, some of us have done some good stuff. But guess what? That too gets nailed to the cross. It's all on the cross because all of that was done in your effort, my effort, according to your will, according to my will. God says, I need none of that because everything you've achieved or everything you failed at was on your timeline, was based on your decision, was based on your reasoning. And you can't reason your way into my kingdom. This righteousness I've given you, this salvation I've given you, this gift I've given you is solely based on the works of my son and no one else so do not let the enemy use your history against you because it all counts for nothing and it's right there on the cross it's important for us to know that and here's why because Ephesians 2 verse 1 through 3 tells us something that I think we forget and it's this and you were dead in your in your transgressions and sin Say dead. In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the rule of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all also formerly say all. You know, the word all here means all. That means every single one of us. I don't care how good or bad you grew up. You're no different than the most heathenistic person in the world. If you said, but I grew up in a Christian home. It don't make a difference. Come on now. It don't make a difference. You too have to give an account for your sinful nature. And therefore, there's nothing you can do about it. It's all based on his sacrifice. And so here, Paul writes to the church at Ephesus and reminds them because sometimes we lose our mind. We forget these things. He says, among whom we all also formally conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, doing the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. In other words, even as everybody else. We're no different. We were no different. Ephesians 2, 5 and 6 says, even when we were dead, here goes the word dead again, dead in our transgressions, made us alive together, say together, 
with Christ, by grace you have been saved and raised up with him. Here you go. I love this part. And seated us with him. Where? In the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Whew. Jesus brings life to that which is dead. Guys, I don't care where your life has been, what it's led you to, what it looks like, what, where you have gone. Jesus is the only one who can bring life to that which is dead. In fact, he's in the business of bringing dead things to life. He's in the business of bringing dead things to life. Some of you this morning, you may feel there's some dead things in your life and you don't know what to do because you don't feel, you don't feel. Listen, we say revival. I don't know if we understand the context of that, that word in and of itself. If you're having to revive something, that means it once was alive, now it's dead. You've got to revive it. Jesus is in the business of bringing life to dead things. You see, if we want revival, we'll never get revival if we're not willing to admit some things have died. Based on what the Holy Spirit led pastor to say, some of us, what has died is the first love. And God is here with the supernatural defibrillator, ready to hit us hardcore to bring it back to life. But we've got to understand there's nothing you can do for that thing to come back to life. It's only him who brings it to life. Are you willing to respond to the spiritual defibrillator? The word of God is the spiritual defibrillator, church. It is the word of God that will bring life to the dead things in our lives. It's never too late. Look at somebody say it's never too late. You have not missed your moment. You have not missed your moment. Believe that you can be made alive together with Christ. Ephesians 2.8 reads, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Understand gift. You ever had somebody just give you a gift randomly? You know humanly because we're so selfish, we don't know how, to, we, we don't know how that computes. We're like, why, why are you giving me this? The first thing we do is ask, what did I do to deserve this? The nerve of us that we go to God and say, what did I do to deserve this? He's going to say nothing. It was my mercy and my grace on your life. You want to know why that's important? See, selfish people don't like that. Because selfish people want to work for something. They want others to work for it as well. Don't be selfish. And don't be mad that God will say, you didn't have to work for this thing. You want to know why that's important? Because some of us don't even have the strength to do it for ourselves. That's why it is his love and his mercy on your life that he can pull us out the pit. That's how we walk in this righteousness that Abraham was, was accredited to. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Are you guys with me this morning? The second thing that we find in Romans 4, and this is from verses 6 to verse 12. We just talked about verses 1 to verse 5. But Romans 6 to verse 12, it talks about the blessing of faith apart from works. The blessing of faith apart from works. We say, well, pastor, that's hard to understand because the Bible says faith without works is dead. It does say that because if you do have faith, then we will see that in action. But there is a blessing of faith apart from works. In other words, the blessing comes by faith, not by the works. The works is simply an indicator that we have faith. But the works is not the activator of 
the blessing. What activates the blessing is the faith. See, some of y'all want to activate blessings in your life, then we have to apply faith in order for the blessings to be activated. And when we see that the blessings are activated, we will know that they are truly by God because works will be demonstrated in our life because we will let the world know by our life that we love God and are called according to his purpose. In these verses, Paul further explains that even King David, a man after God's own heart, understood the blessing of being counted righteous apart from works. He actually quotes in these verses, verses four to, um, verses six through eight, he's quoting Psalm 32, verses one and two. This is what uh, Paul is quoting from David, and he's talking about how the fact that God credits righteousness apart from works is blessed, is, being, is, 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 is an actual blessing to us all. And here's what it says in Romans 6, 8, so you understand uh, what, I'm, what I'm referring to. He says, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the man, hear me, to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Look what he says. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. And whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. You ought to rejoice that what we have done, he is not taking it into account. In fact, he is letting us know we are blessed because of that. But you won't walk in that blessing if you don't have faith to believe it. You see, we oftentimes, we think the devil is messing with us. It's our own mind. We're choosing not to believe the word of God when it says if you simply believe. You will reap the benefits of the blessing because it takes faith to believe. My God. Hopefully, hopefully this ain't going over your head, church. Simply believe. Now hear me. Because we have to be careful. I don't like how oftentimes we misappropriate scripture and we misapply scripture. Because we'll hear people say, well, the Bible says that even the demons believe. It's not it, it, two different beliefs. It's not belief in Jesus. It's believe he's capable to do what he can do. You can believe Jesus is capable to do what he do. But is your belief in the son of God? Is your belief in the king of kings and the Lord of lords? The deliverer, the healer, the savior. Is your belief in him when he says I can turn your life around? Do you believe that he can turn your life around? In spite of all the craziness you've done, in spite of all the things you've said in your heart, you've never said it outward, but you know in your heart you said some dark things. In spite of all that, do you believe that he can still love you? Because if you don't believe it, what's happening is you're missing the blessing that comes by way of faith. Some of you this morning, may God deliver you from that thinking that you have to earn your way into his kingdom. That your past has any power over you. It does not in the name of Jesus. It's quiet in here. Listen, we can't take credit for our salvation. Jesus is our credit. Jesus is our credit. Yo, credit is pretty awesome. You get excited. Today I was, uh, at, you know, there's no reception you can get in this building. It's horrible. I got to go outside because we needed a little jump drive. So I said, I told Carlos, I'm going to go out outside real quick, and I'm going to order a jump drive because we needed a jump drive. So I go outside, and I'm ordering it. And I'm like, it says zero. Zero. I was like, it says zero dollars. And I looked. I was like, oh, snap, I got a credit. That's awesome. So you, you know what I do next, right? I'm looking for what else I can go get. <laughs> I'm going to exhaust that credit to the last dollar, y'all. I'm here to tell you it has been accredited to you, church, this righteousness. You better use up every little ounce of that righteousness that has been accredited to you. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, use every ounce that's been accredited to you. We do it for everything else. Why not do it for the gift that he gives you? 
Listen, the essence of this message is that God's grace and forgiveness are freely available to all who put their faith in Jesus. Regardless of your past sins and works, that makes no difference but that you simply believe in him. Paul then goes on to highlight that the circumcision in the life of Abraham has no significance. He begins to say that Abraham's faith was credited to him before he was actually circumcised. Romans 4.10 says, how then was it counted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. In other words, God says the thing, the blessing that he wants to accredit to your life is before you even do a thing. Because you're not going to take credit for the blessing in your life. Mm -mm -mm. You're not going to be able to say, God's blessing me because I tithe. God blesses me because I show up to church. God blesses me because I look the best. God blesses me because I'm tall. God blesses me because I'm small. You can come up with a reason why that you choose as why God blesses you. He goes, nope, sorry. It was before any of those works. It's simply because you chose to believe in spite of anything and everything else. Listen, circumcision was a sign of the old covenant, and that's where it served at. But it did not precede, it didn't come before, in order to earn Abraham's righteousness. It was his faith that mattered. It is your faith that matters, church. It was his faith that was credited to him as righteousness. You do not have to do something to earn God's approval. You know, man, hmm, man may put that requirement on you. You may, do some, you may need to do some things to earn man's approval, but we're not talking about man. We're talking about God. We're talking about the son of man. We're talking about the creator of man. All you must do is put your faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Yeah, I could just feel his presence. The third thing I want to share about this book here is that before chapter 4, and Pastor Rick touched on a point of this, before, and we'll get into this in chapter 5, but it's interesting how Paul couples this. He kind of sandwiches this point, and that's justification. He sandwiches it with this point of righteousness and faith. And I want you to understand when it talks about God, because it says in verse 5, it says, but to the one who does not work but believes upon him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteous. Justify simply, justification simply is an act done by Jesus alone. We are justified not because of anything we do. We are justified because of one act and one act alone, and that was Jesus dying on the cross for you and I. Sanctification is the other portion of that. That is a progression of us living for him. Every day we are being sanctified. And the reason why I bring that up is because before I go to this last point, is that's where I believe sometimes the wrestle begins. Because we try to attribute justification as if it's sanctification. No, you have been justified by one act alone, and that's what Jesus done on the cross. You can't justify yourself. He's justified you. However, the process of sanctification, what that means is daily, on a daily basis, you have to choose to die to yourself. Why is it important to die to yourself? Because he brings life to dead things. If you're not giving him something to work with, he ain't working with nothing. Oh, man, hopefully that just snapped on somebody right here. You see, you want to know why God hasn't done much work in your life? Because you, yet yet, you have not yet decided to die to some things. Not until we choose to die to some things can God revive those things. You've got to give it up in order for him to bring it back to life sanctified because you've already been justified. You ain't got to do nothing. Just let it go. 
Don't hold on to it no more. Don't make an excuse for it no more. Look at that dead thing and say, I just need you to stay dead so that God can do a work. The last point that I want to get to and the reason why I want to address the dead thing one more time is that the last point that we'll find covered in Romans 4 verses 13 to verse 25, the latter portion of this book. And again, I tried to do as much as I can in such a short time. But it's this, it's the promise of faith. The promise of faith. This is what we begin to hear and discover in these last portions of the book. Paul focuses on the promise received through faith. He teaches that the promise to Abraham and his offspring was not based on keeping the law, but on faith. See, God's promise for your life, guys, please don't get caught up because, again, as Pastor said, that's why I could say it because he brought it up. Us, you know, the charismatic Pentecostal heritage, you know, I love I love the Pentecostal heritage that, that I come from. But the problem that oftentimes we find ourselves in is we miss the mark when it comes to the very things that God holds us all accountable to. And what you find in some of our circles is that the more you do, the more you become justified. And what it does is it creates this environment of show production. Is how well you can put on this show. And so I'm going to out Shonda you. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And if you don't shout as loud as I do, you ain't as saved as I am. There we go again, putting markers on people's lives. Competition. Oh, they're raising their hand. I got to raise my hand a little bit higher. The nerve of us. But we'll find ourselves in this place that we think it's the works that we do that earn us this credit of righteousness. And it's not, church. Not whatsoever. Verses 14 says, for the promise to Abraham or to his seed that he would be heir, ready for this, of the world. Talk about pressure. Heir to heir of the world was not through the law. In other words, was not through anything he could do, achieve, or follow through with. But through the righteousness of faith. In other words, it was all accredited to him by simply believing. May you just be released from thinking you got to do something again. Just believe. Put your full trust in him and him alone. Paul affirms that faith brings life and righteousness, whereas the law only brings judgment and condemnation. You will always fall short. We will always fall short if you depend on your strength and capability, your faith in what God wills for your life and your belief in that it will happen uh, and your belief that it will happen is all that you actually need. Do you believe that what he did for you, he saw more greatness in you that you see in yourself? Do you believe that you were worth it? See, some of us have a hard time with that. Some of us don't even know what that burden is like, but I've heard people's hearts before share with me. I never, I thank God I didn't have to struggle with that. That doesn't make me better than them because I have other things in my life that I had to let go of. There, I had other things in my life that I had to make sure that I let those things die so that he can revive. Amen. But some of y'all have to just receive the fact that if you just believe that he can turn it around, he will turn it around. Amen. We depend on it. We will always fall short on our capabilities and our strength. 
Abraham serves as a model for all believers who trust in God's promises. His faith was unwavering even when faced with the impossible of his circumstances. You understand Abraham was in his 90s, y'all. He was in his 90s. The last thing he was thinking about was cheering. The last thing. He was in his 90s. And so this is why I love the Bible, because we'd be like, yeah, but you don't understand. I may not understand, but Abraham does. And he's the father of faith. That's what the Bible calls him. And if he made a decision to realize there's nothing he can do, the Bible says he was as his dead in his body. Because he was too old to be having kids. And then his wife was just as old. Her womb was barren and dead as far as the Bible concerned. But it didn't make God no difference because it was not in their capabilities that God's promises come to fruition. His promises are not dependent on what you and I can do. Stop thinking that it's based on us whether or not God's promises are fulfilled in our lives. It's simply based on do you actually believe it? Do you believe you're worth it? In spite of what your family tells you. In spite of what your spouse tells you. Some of you, in spite of what your children tell you, they may tell you you're worthless. You can never achieve something. It's pointless. You've always failed. You're always going to be a failure. In spite of hearing that nonsense, do you still make the decision to put your faith and trust in Jesus? Aren't you glad it ain't based on your works? Aren't you glad it ain't based on your capabilities? He brings life to dead things. He brings life to dead things. So this morning, today, we have a choice to say, moving forward, I choose to die to self so that revival can begin in me. Stop asking for revival to break out in the church. Church. Ask him to break out revival in the church. You. That can't happen, nor will it happen if you're not willing to die to self. That's the only way revive. If you're alive, there's nothing to revive. And if you're alive, it's because you're doing it all on your own. There's not one story in the Bible that you will find God using somebody that had it all put together in order for them to do it. Not one person. From the point of him calling Moses, he didn't have what it takes, but God did it. God did it. You name it. You say, well, David. No, what about David? What about David? David could do nothing. You see, David's the one exception because I heard somebody, I was having this conversation a while back, and somebody said, David, aha, I got you, Pastor. No, you don't. In fact, this ain't me, so I don't care. You can get me, but you ain't got nobody else. Here's why David's not even the exception. Because what does the Bible say about David before the story of David actually began? It is this, that he was anointed and the spirit of God rushed upon him. He couldn't do anything he did in his own strength. It was the unction of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the empowering of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way you and I can do what God has called us to do. Don't you dare think it's your gift. Don't you dare think it's your talent. Don't you dare think it's your ability. It's the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit who will give life to something that would otherwise be dead and use it for his glory. And look at the devil and say, ha, (laughs) <laughs> Did you see my servant? <laughs> you see? God wants to bless your life. And he can do it simply by you and I just saying, yes, Lord. Just raise your hands this morning and just say that with me. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Abraham serves as a model to all believers who trust in God's promises. His faith was unwavering. Even when faced with impossible circumstances. Abraham believed that God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist could fulfill his promise. 
This same faith is available to us today, enabling us to trust in God's promises and walk in righteousness. Come on, just keep your hands up. Don't get tired. Don't get tired. Let the Lord touch your life this morning. May your raising of your hands be an expression of surrender to him. May the raising of your hands be an expression of saying, God, I put my faith and trust in you from this day forward. I will not rely on my abilities. I will not rely on my strength. I would not even allow my past to tell me it can't be done because it's not based on me. It's solely based on you. My trust is in you and you alone. Father, bless your people this morning as we are reminded that righteousness is not attained through our efforts or good deeds, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Abraham, the father of faith, believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. This powerful example underscores the truth that our righteousness is a gift from God. Receive through faith in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, Father, we bless your name, Lord. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. May we walk by faith. May we walk by faith and put our trust in him. And may the faith of Abraham be an inspiration to us all and to continue to grow within us all. If you're here this morning and this whole Jesus thing is something that you've tried to figure out, you've tried to measure your own life and say, ah, I got to get that together. I'll be back. You know, some of us hit, hit Jesus with the, with the Terminator line, I'll be back. It's okay. You can laugh. There's nothing super spiritual about this moment. Because you putting your faith in Jesus is a conscious decision knowing exactly what you're doing. So that's purposely why I just wanted to make you laugh. Because I don't want you to think that you need to be moved. You need to be coerced to put your faith in Jesus. No, you do not. You need to be aware that this is the best decision you could ever make in your life. Nothing will ever compare to this choice right here. Do you believe in him? Do you believe that he can turn your life around? Do you believe he can save you from the darkness that you're headed otherwise? The Bible says we are children of wrath outside of our faith in Jesus. This is what the Bible says. This is why you got to be careful that you don't call everybody a child of God. Because the Bible tells us when we are not saved, we're children of wrath. But here's the good thing. There's nothing you have to do to turn that around except believe. That he is Lord and Savior. Believe that him dying on the cross, resurrecting on the third day, and sitting at the right hand of the Father gave you the opportunity to put your faith and trust in him and him alone. And if you choose to do that this day, your life will never be the same. The bounds of hell will have to let you go. You see, in moments like this, this is where the devil doesn't want the truth to come out. The only way to break the bondage of sin is to put your life in the hand of Jesus because he's the only one that has the power to defeat sin, death, hell, and the grave. He's the only one. And so if there's some dead things in your life that you just want to let go of, and by letting go, saying, Jesus, I'm going to put my trust and faith in you, then there's no better time to do that than right now. And so while everybody else just takes this moment for themselves, if you're already saved and you already put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then take this moment to pray for someone that may not have that moment right now. And I'm going to ask that if you would like to experience a change in your life starting today by putting your faith and trust in Jesus and him alone, then I'm going to ask that you just raise your hand for a quick moment. Just raise your hand. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Listen, that's five people. We ought to rejoice. We ought to rejoice. 
Here's why we ought to rejoice, because all of heaven is rejoicing right now, the Bible says. There is a celebration in heaven right now because the chains of darkness have hit the ground. And they've hit the ground because Jesus and Jesus alone has set the captives free. Father, we just bless what you're doing right now. And I pray for every individual that raised their hand this morning. Simply to put their trust and faith in you and you alone. I ask, Lord God, that you put the right people in their lives so that they can, begin, begin, they can become discipled. So that their lives can begin to mirror that of a follower of Jesus Christ. We thank you now, Lord, because the hardest work was done. The work that we couldn't do on our own, you just did. You set them free from the bondage of sin. You've broken the chains. It no longer has power over you. The enemy has been rendered powerless over your life. Don't you ever forget it. Don't you let anybody tell you any different. The Bible says he who the sun sets free is free indeed. Walk in the freedom that Jesus has given you.